At this moment of the drawing, I'm almost ready to start putting values into my shadows and transforming this from a relatively abstract exercise, which is to say a drawing that is made with line, an abstract element, into something a lot more visual. So we'll have shadow shapes and light shapes, and we'll actually start working on organizing a three to four value structure within the drawing. Before that though, I really have some serious mistakes to tidy up. There's things about the position of the leg on the left hand side. I think it's a little bit low. I think in fact, overall, the top of the torso is a little bit low, a little bit short in relationship to the proportions of the lower half and many things in between. I'm going to talk you through those while I'm making those changes on my drawing. And you can also focus on making those changes in your drawings in your studios, because believe me, and I think I've made this pretty clear, but I'll repeat it anyway. The things that you correct now mean that you can move on with confidence later. My lines at this moment still should be really quite open. You can see that with the mechanical pencil, they tend to be a little bit tighter than they are with the wooden pencil. Though that's the case, I think in general, it's all right. They're not getting tight up into that point where I feel like I, I'm not able to kind of control them or keeping them feeling as if they are kind of open lines that are there just kind of waiting for correction. I think at the moment, my expectation of inaccuracy here is kind of decreasing. So, you know, there's several things that I feel like probably are going to get big changes. And I think in general, as I kind of compare this leg out here with some of the measurements and some of the axes, you know, that I've created, uh, or some of the relationships I've created along horizontal axes, uh, gets gives me the feeling it's going to kind of move upward. Uh, there's also, like I said, up here, there's some pretty major stuff that I think actually is kind of a little bit low, a little bit small in size. And so I'm going to need to kind of expand and extend that to get the right proportions. In general, I kind of like to draw before I erase. If I feel like I have a pretty clear idea of where the change is supposed to go, I'll, I'll actually try and keep in a way the, uh, the line underneath. So I just know like where I'm moving things because right now I have to move this. And so I'm thinking to myself, well, maybe I can move it actually just about the same distance and having those ghost lines hanging out there. It actually helps me a little bit to see where I'm going. At a certain point though, once I've kind of completed the reconstruction, I think eventually it's a benefit to, I always refer to it as kind of cleaning up after myself. So when I was young, my mother was teaching me a bit about cooking and she proposed a philosophy of cleaning up as you go. So you make one preparation, let's say you're cutting all your vegetables. Then, you know, you would clean that up before you went to actually go cooking them in the pot. Now, what she's talking about here really is uh, essentially batch processing, where we're going to get through with one group of things uh, before we kind of move on to another. Uh, and uh, how that applies to drawing is that I, I do find we want to keep our drawing well organized. And in a sense, that's, that's kind of like tidiness or cleanliness, right? Meaning I don't want to leave behind too many artifacts, you know, from previous mistakes, you know, I want to see the new version of the leg that I've made, not the old version. Now there's this phenomenon also when you're moving one thing up, like I just moved this up a couple of millimeters. That means that other things in that area that I had plotted out based upon where this previously was, I need to pull them up along with it. So bear in mind, when you're making your changes, there is a very likely domino effect. That's going to mean you need to check really kind of everything in that area before becoming confident about it once again. Now, we talk a lot and I talk a lot about hierarchies and this usually relates or associates to something we're talking about in terms of value or we're talking about in terms of, say, edge quality. 
but there's also in a way like a hierarchy of information, which is to say, what do you put into a block-in and what do you leave out of a block-in? I think it's an interesting moment for us to maybe just take a quick look at some of the things that I've left out and some of the things I brought into this early stage. So let's take a look at the abdomen here. Right? We have these shadows that kind of pass across, these creases that pass across the abdomen. There's also all of this halftone information in here. Now I've chosen to leave that out because I don't think it is the, the most structurally relevant feature in that area. I've chosen things which have a stronger contrast. Uh, I've chosen things that connect together to the contour and show the symmetry right, of the construction of this subject rather than something that I think indicates a lot more the form. The same thing is going to take place with a lot of the information through here. Why have I left this entire area blank? Mostly because I think those marks are essentially made a little bit at random. If you've taken a look at the actual sculpture itself, you'll see that this is where a whole area of the shoulders has been cleaved off of the surface of the Belvedere torso, and what's left behind is these kind of pock marks of a broken stone that don't necessarily have like a structural logic to them in the way that say like the form of the thigh might do and, and then would give us this sense of, of a form inducing shadow and light situation. Here it's almost more of a jigsaw puzzle of shapes that once everything around them is correct can be just made correct inside of that. So for you, when you're making your drawing and you don't have me to watch and you're asking yourself the question, what is relevant to what I need at this stage? I think that you have to ask the question, is it the most substantial feature in that area? Does it guide me towards being able to place the shadow and light or the impactful shadow and light in that area? And is it something that can be appropriately indicated using the kind of information that I'm using at this stage, which is line segments, which are a little bit darker and a little bit lighter. Okay, so tentatively at present, I feel pretty good about indicating the shadow shapes in this and laying in my first value. Now, when that happens, it's gonna be pretty dramatic. The difference in recognizability between the bark itself and our drawing of the bark. At this moment, you need to be fluent in a language of line and line quality in order to find really the similarities in between the two. This is a highly technical language. As I said at the beginning of this segment, it's really abstract. As soon as we go into shadow and light, it's going to become dramatically real. Now, with that is going to be the burden of proof on the design of the drawing. The more real your drawing becomes, the more dissimilarities in between your drawing and your subject are going to rise up. So there's going to be the blessing of us being able to see it a little bit more clearly, but the curse perhaps <laughs> of all of our mistakes kind of bubbling up to the surface. At this moment also, I just want to free you up from the idea of, uh, of thinking that your block-in needs to be perfect. You know, these principles and these exercises, they're not here to belittle us in our natural state of imperfection, but to communicate what they are and what we're doing with them, we simply need to address the idea of perfection. We need to say that in a perfect world, yes, our block-in would be entirely accurate. We don't live in a perfect world and we've got to make peace with that, otherwise we'll never get anything done. <laughs> so I like to aim for a lot of accuracy, even if that means that I don't arrive in that place, but that I get into the neighborhood of that place. It's worth noting that indicating the shadow shapes doesn't mean drawing every single value shape that you have available to you. I'm only interested in the primary core shadow shapes. Now, maybe I need to use a different term there. A core shadow is a particular aspect of a shadow. And what I mean to say is the group of shadows that make up the most apparent value shapes within the drawing. Okay, I think it's officially time to put in our shadow value. I'm gonna use probably a B or 2B lead, whatever it is I have inside this pencil, which, you know, usually I keep pretty strict track of, I would say in this situation. If it's anything from an HB to a 2B, I could achieve the same effect with it, just judging by the kind of lightness of my application. And 
So for you at home, if you want to use somewhere within that range between you know HB and 2B, I think you're welcome to do that. And uh, I'm just gonna dial in some of the values across here, and we're just gonna see the image that emerges once that happens. Now remember, your initial application of value should be relatively even. You don't want to just dive in and create this cacophony of value that later you have to work over and over and over again to compensate for. But you also don't need to make your initial lay-in of value the smoothest value application that has ever happened. Just bear in mind, it should take you a little while to do. It shouldn't happen in a flash, but it shouldn't take you the whole day either. There's a couple other areas where there are little shapes like, uh, like in here. I think mostly we can leave them out. Like I said, this is the, the first kind of broadest application of value. And all I want to do is, is create a situation where we have two value groups to look at. And I'm going to go ahead now and just give a light stumping to these areas. And since I've used a pretty soft lead, uh, it should be quite susceptible to the the application of the paper stump. So it should give you a little bit more flatness than say, if you're using a very hard lead, it's a little bit more difficult to push around. Which by the way, it's not, uh, it's not a bad thing to be difficult to push around. You know, when you're in your highlights, your hierarchy areas, that that's what you want. And uh, while, well, like I said, at home, you can be doing this with a much harder pencil, and it's almost kind of what I recommend. A harder pencil also will generally give you a little bit more of an even value in its first application before stumping. And so as you go, you just want to kind of clean up and tidy up the value. You're shooting for something that is distinguishable as a single value shape. Really, that's almost the only criteria. You don't want to feel like it's full of accents or second or third values inside the shadow. You just want to feel like it's kind of one shadow now, or rather that it's one value. Now, in reality, there will be different shades of, of gray here, and that's fine. That's okay. <laughs> um, again, it's, it's not about perfection today. It's about perfection really at the end of the process. Um, but I'm going through this much in the same way as I did applying the value. I'm not jumping through the drawing with the stump in, you know, in the blink of an eye. I'm, I'm just taking my time to go through each area and create as even a value as I can. Now, as time goes on working in this way, I want to communicate that, yes, it will become more fluid. You will more frequently be reading and reacting to what you're seeing rather than maybe going through steps that can feel perhaps a little bit arduous. At times, especially when you're first going through them. But it's like any learned behavior. I used to tell the story about how when I lived in Sweden, I had to go to a physical therapist for the first time. I had some back pain uh, that had been bothering me for a while and I needed to go to what they called a hyckgymnast in, uh, in Sweden. It's like a, yeah, a physical doctor, like somebody who, um, who is there to, to improve your body, not to necessarily to um, yeah, give you medicine or anything, right? So she taught me this series of exercises for my back to strengthen it, uh, all of which were very strange body movements, uh, getting onto the floor and kind of lifting, you know, a, a leg up this way and an arm over that way. And it was all very awkward. <laughs> the first time I did it, by the hundredth time I had done it, you know, these movements became something that were, if not natural feeling, uh, certainly a, a second nature that I did not question. Uh, but I had to get used to, to the actions those, those movements until it became a kind of muscle memory. And 
your drawing, or rather, in this case, your process, needs to become like that. It needs to become a second nature or a muscle memory. Something that you don't necessarily think about doing, you simply do. Because by the time that we get to much more complex projects in the atelier tier, such as still life painting, uh, such as cast painting, any of these projects that are going to involve dealing with much more complex subject matter, you're going to need to spend your time and your focus on that. Figuring out how to create color harmonies in oil paint, rather than trying to figure out how to judge and measure proportions. So, in this moment, that's why it's so important that you learn these things here, is that if you find yourself later focusing on them, you will not have the bandwidth necessary to focus on the lessons that are at hand in those later moments. I also want to do a little bit more to this contour. I feel like I have let it get a little bit muddy. I want to bring it back to a nice, clear, structured place. And that is going to feel really good. I mean, you know when you've kind of taken care of the fundamentals of your drawing, you know, it's a, it's a satisfying feeling. And eventually, you know, that's maybe something really worth communicating here. The practice of drawing can be really, really satisfying eventually. You know, it's going to take a little while before it does, and I think that you could even say there will be a part early on when the feeling of drawing might kind of suck. However, I know that that passes. I know that eventually, through repetition and practice, you get to a place where, again, can be quite satisfying, but it takes a lot of practice. It does. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to say that anything about what we're doing today or during the entire course of this process is going to make drawing easy for you. I, I don't think it ever gets to that place. I don't know if I would necessarily be satisfied with it if it was easy. I think it becomes manageable. I think it becomes a challenge that you can embrace because you're aware of the parameters of the challenge. But I don't, I don't think anything about it ever becomes easy and I think that's fine. I think that's okay. I wouldn't want it to be otherwise. You know, I, you always uh, hear out there in the world books, classes that profess to tell you the secrets of this or that practice and how the thing that you thought was going to be difficult is actually easy. And I think that robs you, actually, of a certain level of satisfaction when you do find yourself in control and able to manifest your vision. It's not because it's easy, it's because you practiced. 